Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Adepoje, and I'm the community manager for the uh, International Center for Journalists, uh, Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. And um, like I always say during the uh, since uh, previous editions of these uh, of these discussions, uh, these initiatives started as uh, our response to the COVID pandemic. And the goal has always been to help journalists in different parts of the world uh, to improve their reporting skills. But with several other uh, crises uh, happening in real time in different parts of the world, and sometimes, uh, as we are going to see today, uh, crisis overlapping. Uh, sometimes the country may be dealing with two or three or more crises at the same time. Uh, there is also the need to bring these issues to the attention of journalists in different parts of the world so that they know what the key issues are, what issues that they've been are being underreported, and what needs uh, to still be uh, done so that attention is given to uh, some of these issues. And um, in 2022, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, caught global attention. And uh, while reporting has always been on the ammunition, the numbers of deaths, the numbers of missiles, and the likelihood or non-likelihood of nuclear escalation, uh, the impact of this crisis on death, several other issues, may seem not to be getting the much uh, the same uh, attention as the war itself uh, is having. But these issues are having a uh, life-threatening impact on different aspects of issues. And um, we also have people who are on treatment uh, that may have their treatment protocol disrupted. And but we also have uh, stories of resilience, not just of artists or musicians that are taking guns and going to us, but also of health workers that are still making effort to continue that they continue to provide services. And that's something that we want to highlight uh, today on this conversation to understand how the war in Ukraine is impacting HIV care. So allow me to welcome uh, Sagi Antonia, who is a researcher and infectious disease physician at the Institute of Epidemiology and Infectious Disease uh, in Kiev, Ukraine. Thank you for joining us, Sagi. How are you doing today? Hi, Paul. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, I would say I'm pretty much okay uh, in the given conditions that we have at the moment. So how have you been doing? I'm doing well, so thank you very much. And we also have a second panelist uh, who is somebody I've known to be involved in this global fight against HIV is, I think for more than 10 years now, especially in Nigeria. I know him when he started uh, being uh, going back and forth regarding enlightening people on how to actually from individual regional basis, and today is also actively involved uh, on national, on nationwide, uh, on a, on a uh, well positioned nationwide initiative, we would call it PIN. So let me welcome Oyekachi Onumara. Hi, Oyekachi, how are you doing today? And thank you for joining us. I'm fine, Paul. <laughs> Should I say happy what it's day? Oh, yes, yes, it's Happy World Day's Day. I think uh, for people like you that are always involved in this hate campaign, uh, December 1 is always a day that is important in your calendar. And I know if I'm not wrong, uh, is there any other day within the year where attention is driven to HIV AIDS issues more than December 1? Uh, Onumara, is there any other day in the year? For, for, for us, 365 days, 24 hours every day, we are talking and discussing programming, reprogramming for HIV one way or the other. So um, December 1st is just the day we bring it to Lamb Life, everybody to see that we're actually doing some things. Okay. Then uh, I also want to ask uh, Sagi, uh, what is the... Uh, what is the, the World AIDS Day like uh, this year uh, in Kyiv and uh, in other parts of Ukraine? And how is it different from how it is usually celebrated uh, before the war? Well, um, I, uh, to be honest, I fully agree with uh, Anikachi because um, in, in my field, we are talking about HIV like 365 days a year, uh, sometimes even 24 seven because of um, time differences that some of my colleagues currently have who had to move outside the country. 
Uh, and yeah, sure. The, today is quite different compared to previous years, but still we talk a lot. Today, many organizations uh, that are involved in HIV care, they still uh, work in the field. Um, our clinical doctors are still doing their best to provide HIV care to our patients. And yeah, so today is different, but uh, the good thing is that we keep this feeling that uh, today is one of the most important days for us, for those who are involved in HIV care. It's still as important as it was in the previous years. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'll also like to welcome our participants that are joining us today. Uh, if you're watching this live stream on, on Facebook, uh, we are we are usually on two Facebook pages. Uh, the pages for the International Journalist Network, Hygiene Net. We say thank you for joining us. And if you're also watching us uh, on our ICFG forums page, I also say thank you for joining us today. And um, if you are also on the Zoom platform, we are always happy to know where you are joining us from if you are with us. So you can engage with us and let us know where you are joining us from today. So um, if we look at uh, the global AIDS uh, scenario, uh, the 1990 goal uh, continues uh, to be a rallying point for attention and uh, for encouragement, for motivation, and for inspiration. So um, me, I know what 1990 is, but I, for those that are just hearing that you need to go for the first time, uh, Rick, I want you to break it down and uh, the indications of how far we have gone uh especially from your perspective in nigeria and the, what you think the issues are that are still uh limiting the attainment of this global goal all right thank you paul um the 1990 goals uh very ambitious goals set by the un uh that uh that 2020 um 90 percent of those who are hiv positive will know their status uh, the second 90, those who are positive, 90% of those who are positive are placed on treatment and retained in care. And the third 90, that those who are placed in care, 90% of those who are placed in care will attain virus suppression. That is, at this point, um, the person can no longer transmit the virus even through a uh, sexual route, which is usually the main route. Um, it's quite a huge, just like the one says, it's an ambitious target. It's an ambitious target. But if we are aiming for the, uh, if we if we're aiming for the star, if, if we hit the moon, it's not a bad one. But that's that's how ambitious the UN AIDS goals were. For us in Nigeria, um, I think last two years we we are able to see that uh, we are forty percent short of the first ninety while achieving the other two 90s. That is the first 90s looking at testing, prevention and testing, while the second 90s looking at uh, linkage to care, and uh, the third 90s looking at retention to care and achieving virus suppression. All these are different cascades of the HIV program globally and even uh, in Nigeria. For us, what we have done, um, we, like I was sharing with uh, Stella earlier, we have a very robust program. Um, it did not grow out of the blues. We've made our mistakes over the years. We've learned, we've shared best practices, um, we've shared ideas. We've also had um, donor funds. A lot of donor funds have come into Nigeria in the past 20 years, especially global funds, EFA, um, um, USAID, and the rest of them over the years, they funded a whole lot of program. And we keep inventing and reinventing uh, approaches that work. Um, currently, we are doing what we call the DSD model, that is differentiated service delivery model, looking at um, who are those mostly affected by HIV? Who are, who are the, who are the, who are the uh, uh, drivers of HIV in Nigeria? And how can we reach this population with services that are unique, services that respect their human rights, services that, that, that will reach them unlike before? Because we found that um, Nigerians and 
especially male Nigerians, have very poor uh, health-seeking behavior. We don't go to the hospital um, until it's almost late. My mother will say that we don't go to the hospital until we are close to the mortuary. Uh, we'll really, <laughs> so it means most Nigerians will try taking um, 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 prophylaxis, taking uh, some level of treatment, taking herbs, and uh, even going spiritual uh, at home. Uh, when all these things don't work, we start seeking, we start going to the hospital. And most of the time, the case must have become very terrible that they may not get the best of care that they would have gotten. So for prevention, we've done a whole lot of testing, a lot of, a whole lot of testing. We took, the, we took testing out from the facility more to the community because since Nigerians will not go to the hospital to get themselves tested, a whole lot has been done in the areas of using community-based organizations to, to carry out testing at the communities. So um, we have also engaged um, um, key population uh, organizations because in Nigeria, as small as the key population is, they are the drivers of the pandemic currently in Nigeria. So a whole lot of attention has been shifted to that area, bringing uh, um, um, key population-led organizations to run the HIV test in their, to, 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 to identify community members, identify where they are, identify hotspots, get them tested, and if they are positive, linked to care. Another area we are doing very well is uh, using behavioral uh, change messaging because um, we are trying to ensure that those who are negative remain negative while we are also providing treatment for those who are positive. The, the inclusion of PrEP, that is pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, is also a good one that is also uh, uh, um, being invented and reinvented. I was told recently a project called uh, Mosaic Project that is being anchored by FHI 360. They are looking at um, using injectable PrEP. That is PrEP, uh, I'm, okay, maybe for the sake of our audience, uh, PrEP, there are drugs that we, there are antiviral drugs that are provided to persons who are negative, but who are at high risk of contracting HIV. They are placed on these drugs to ensure that they don't contract HIV. And the research have shown that 80 to 90%, uh, they are 80 to 90% effective if taken as prescribed. So. For members of the key population who are at high risk of contracting HIV, uh, PrEP has been also uh, pushed forward in the course of our prevention activities. Then linkage is also an issue. Linkage, that is, I have been tested positive, now I need to go to the facility to take up uh, ART services and other services. Remember, we are in a very conservative country like Nigeria, where um, a whole lot of key population activities are either criminalized or stigmatized or discriminated against and all that. So remember these members of key population don't even want to go to the uh, traditional health facilities in the first place. So now they are HIV positive or they have come down with sexually transmitted infections and they need to go to the health facilities. What we have also done in the course of our programming is to train healthcare providers to be sensitive to members of the key population. Members of the key population include uh, men who have sex with men, uh, female sex workers or sex workers in general, uh, people who inject drugs and the transgender uh, uh, community also. These communities, like I said earlier, are highly discriminated against, highly stigmatized, and in some cases even criminalized. So um, we've also looked at providing them safe space We've come, up, we've come up with what we call one-stop shop. The one-stop shop is a center that provides healthcare services for only members of the key population. Since they, have, they are battling discrimination at the traditional health facilities, and that would be an impediment for them accessing healthcare service, we provided an OSS. The, the OSS are quite few because they are very, very costly to maintain. In the OSS, we have uh, the, the, the integrated service delivery model, where we have both doctors, nurses, lab scientists, pharmacists, uh, even um, um, uh, therapists who give them some level of counseling. So this uh, uh, approach is also working. 
um, for that of, okay, the, I don't know, you, do you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, I think. <laughs> okay, so I don't say so much. <laughs> I think uh, we, uh, people like you can talk for, uh, for what hours, just talking about each other. So we oh, find you. Just talk me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sergey, I want you to draw a sharp contrast <laughs> on the situation in Ukraine. And um, I, one of the key things I think is important, if I'm right, is the fact that uh, the majority of the patients, of your patients in Ukraine, are actually women and not, um, are not uh, men, uh, as in the case is in Nigeria. And um, so let's know what is different, the, the, the HIV outlook uh, in Ukraine, the progress so far, and uh, are you still continue to uh, provide services? And one question that is really, really important for me, if you can also weigh in, is um, what is there a threat that is posed to 1990 goals in Ukraine uh, with the current crisis? Okay, uh, thanks. Uh... Thanks for the question. And thank you so much uh, for the insight uh, regarding Nigeria, because um, I can say that we share some of the features actually. Uh, and uh, well, yeah, but the key difference is I would say that out of 130,000 patients that we have, what we had on treatment before the war, 46.5% uh, were women actually. Because in Ukraine, the main route of transmission is sexual, but it's heterosexual. And, uh, but yeah, we still share the key populations. So those are injective people who inject drugs, uh, men having sex with men, sex workers, and uh, transgender people. And, uh, but still, yeah, we've got a lot of uh, cisgender heterosexual women. Uh, infected in Ukraine, and also that bring us uh, brings us to the point where we have around, I would say two two and a half thousand uh, women uh, with living with HIV, giving birth to children every year. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this year the numbers will be less than that because of uh, the war situation and because many. Uh, Patients with HIV were forced to move out of Ukraine uh, because of the war. And so if just talking about the key features of our epidemic, uh, our estimate number is 210,000. It was before the war. Uh, we also struggle mainly with the first 90 because uh, before the war, we had 71.5% of those um, estimated of living with HIV aware of their HIV status. That was uh, 150,000 roughly. And uh, out of those, 87% received ART and 95% of those receiving ART had viral suppression. So uh, historically in Ukraine, we've um, focused a lot on social care and case management of patients uh, aware of their HIV status and on treatment. I believe that's one thing that brings us to, uh, well, rather high numbers in terms of reaching the second and the third 90. Because um, in almost all HIV clinics, uh, there are social workers, sometimes uh, there are uh, NGOs who provide social support and case management to every patient. And that includes um, reminding about uh, the visits to the clinic, sometimes at the beginning reminding that um, about the features of the regimen that the person uh, receives um, for HIV. And so uh, that's, um, those are the key features of our um, HIV cascade before the war. And of course, um, the war greatly affected uh, the current situation. And uh, um, the data that I currently have uh, as the, uh, on October 1st, we had up to 15,000 patients lost to follow up of those who received treatment before the war started. Uh, this number sounds huge and it actually is, it's more than 10% of the population of those on treatment, but uh, there are still uh, 115,000 of those who continue their treatment. And, um, 
I must say that uh, this multidisciplinary approach that we have, because the team includes a medical doctor, a nurse, a social worker, a case manager, and that all helped a lot in tracking many patients because, um, well, huge numbers of patients were at risk of treatment interruption because uh, some of the treatment sites were closed during the war, some of them are closed now. Uh, because people were um, not able to move to their treatment sites. And to overcome that, we've used as multidisciplinary teams to track those patients that were at risk of uh, a treatment interruption, who were at risk of missing their um, appointments to receive their medication. And uh, that helped a lot because uh, with the help of these teams, we've tracked like more than 40,000 patients who are at risk of um, being lost to follow up and brought them, well, <laughs> so I would say brought them back to HIV care. And the other thing that we've done is that currently um, HIV care is provided to every single patient in every single HIV uh, clinic or ART site, irrespectively of where the person was registered before or where the person received medical care previously. So that helps uh, very much to all the patients that are internally displaced people now, because uh, whenever they need medical help in terms of HIV, they can uh, just find the closest clinic and just uh, get all the care they need uh, right, right there at the place where their current stay. And for that, we have a lot of, we have apps, we have a couple of projects run by NGOs that provide this information to the patients. So basically um, a patient can get information about the closest uh, ART site 24 seven using um, at least, I know at least two apps, uh, one to Telegram bots and uh, websites, emails. I mean, there's a lot of this um, information giving component for the patients uh, because well, that is something that is the hardest for some patients because when they're um, when they're forced to move, they basically they are forced out of their common life. So they need to look for housing, for food, for shelter. I mean, for everything. And um, for some patients, medical care is not the top priority, especially if they have children, if they have other family members that they care about. So uh, we are trying to make it as easier for our patients to access medical care as a technically possible in this uh, in these circumstances that we are facing. And the same goes for uh, all the patients that are moving outside of Ukraine, because uh, at, as of now, we know at least of around 4,200 patients that moved outside of the country. And um, we have a huge involvement of uh, professional um, associations, such as, for example, the uh, EC network group, the European lies in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, EAX, of course, and they're providing a lot of information for um, our patients. Where can they receive uh, ARVs or ta get tested in uh, in given countries? And that helps a lot because uh, a lot of our patients who were forced to move outside the country, they have language barrier. And uh, I know that many clinics, they even hired social workers that are Russian or Ukrainian speaking, and they have hired um, translators, interpreters, just to uh, make the access to HIV care for, for our patients a lot easier. And, uh, oh yeah, also, yeah, please stop me because I, <laughs> sometimes I can also go on like for <laughs> way too long. <laughs> Just feel yeah. free. <laughs> it's okay. I think I'm dealing with uh, two individuals that are really passionate about the issues that they discuss that they are working on. Now, um, Oyekachi, so what is the, uh, of, of course, uh, where you also practice is also uh, prone to some crises. Uh, so what do you think um, the insights uh, from Christ, from responding to crises, uh, and of course, the world still had to deal with COVID-19 when crises was, were everywhere and still continues to deal with COVID-19. So what uh, can we say as the pros and cons of dealing with uh, multiple diseases at the same time? And um, what are your concerns about 
uh, the global reporting regarding HIV. Uh, is it impressive? Uh, what do you still think uh, is still underreported? And I also think that Posa Goyos to Sagi too. Let's talk about your personal assessment of HIV reporting uh, over the years. How has this been? And what do you still think is still not getting attention, even though the world has been reporting on HIV AIDS for decades? Okay, uh, Paul, thank you for that question. Um, Nigeria may not be at war with a superpower currently, but we've been having an um, internal crisis for over 10 years now. Um, it started with uh, the uh, Boko Haram terrorists in the Northeast, um, who later started having issues with a farmer headers crisis in the North Central. Um, currently, we are battling with bandits in the Northeast, uh, in the Northwest region of our country. So uh, uh, um, um, in the South also, we are having um, cases of um, uprising here and there. This crisis, no matter their magnitude, uh, affect uh, our programming. Sometimes uh, when we do our weekly uh, pro uh, reporting, some states will not have reports to give us of some particular areas of their state because those places, those places are crisis prone or they came under attack or former and headers clashes or they had terrorist attacks or they had cases of kidnapping. All this crisis put together affects uh, HIV programming, especially in states uh, that have high prevalence rates. Uh, let's take, for example, Benue and Taraba states. They are neighboring states. Uh, both states have prevalence rates of over two percent, uh, uh, of over two percent. Okay, uh, uh, Taraba is about one point nine percent. I think Benue is about two percent plus. So uh, um, the national prevalence rate currently is about one point four percent. And these states, we are trying to ensure that we provide services in these places. Then crisis hits. In those places, what we have done most of the time is to have areas, safe areas, where we can provide the services for um, our clients. Sometimes also we have worked with stakeholders in those places who help us in drug refill, because sometimes our healthcare workers may, may be endangered. They cannot even go to those places. In Taraba, where I worked um, in some two years ago, uh, some of my healthcare workers uh, were caught in crossfire because they belong to one ethnic group that is fighting against the other ethnic group in the other place. So they can't even go to this place. So these things hamper services. We have increased uh, in persons, uh, uh, what we call IIT, that is uh, uh, intermediate in, in, uh, uh, people dropping out of uh, um, um, service. People who are supposed to come for their drugs are not coming for drug refuse because of one thing or the other. So crisis is an issue, it's affecting us. Now, with the pandemic, it's now a double, what we call wahala in Nigeria. <laughs> it's more like a double trouble of, 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 of crisis, health crisis. Um, we may not have had heavy heat like we saw in Italy and France and, um, 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 and, and the US, but it's here with us. It's here with us. Now, to come to the question of um, reporting, um, I think we've not done enough. As much as um, NACA, that is the agency that is in charge of HIV, it's, uh, HIV response in Nigeria, is telling us that we are close to achieving, um, seeing an end to HIV. There are still some communities that don't have access to HIV services. There are still some communities that have uh, the access to, to HIV and health, any other health service itself have been cut off, either through this, some of this crisis, sometimes even um, 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 what do you call them? Uh, um, um, uh, cases of erosion, they're, they've been cut off from mainland and some 
no accessible roads to get to those places. These are things that are facing us currently in Nigeria. So I think we may have improved in our reporting, we may report, we improved in our surveillance, but we may not be reporting enough because there are still areas that will not reach. Now, when I talk about key population, that's another uh, uh, kettle of fish altogether. We have a good number of members of key population who have not been identified or who are under and identified. For example, um, most of the data we've looked at showing that um, members of the MSM community that we are reaching are usually those between the ages of 16 and 35. So we have the, um, uh, the, the, the elderly MSM community population are not being reached because these are population who will not ordinarily come out to access health services because of their social status in the community and because of the stigma and discrimination that comes with it. So I think we are doing, we are, we are improving, we've made a lot of improvement. We made a lot of improvement in terms of reporting over the years, but there's still so much gap that we've not uh, looked at. I just thought I should point that out. Yeah, let's, I'm, I'm even talking about journalists now. Uh, if okay. stories, uh, I'll come back to you, Oyeka, for a moment. Yeah. Uh, Osagi, I've read a lot about um, the impact of, uh, of, the, of the war on HIV services. I've also seen a number of stories that highlight the local approach to ensuring that uh, the services continue to be provided. But if you look at uh, the reportage so far, um, are there any issues that you have concerned with now it's being reported? And what is your, what do you still think journalists covering health issues as it affects the war are still missing out on the HIV response? Your mic is off. <laughs> All right, my bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, of course, there are always um, some fields that that require extra attention, that require more attention than given, that requires some um, ways to overcome the new challenges. Uh, but uh, as, um, I always try to focus at what we are doing currently to manage the the most problematic areas, I would say. Because of course, uh, one of the issues that we faced is, uh, once again, is similar to what um, Onikachi mentioned in Nigeria. Some of our patients could not reach uh, medical care because they were caught on the in the areas with active uh, hostilities going on or active shelling. And it wasn't just safe to get outside of the shelter. So yeah, we, we've we've seen that a lot, but um, also in Ukraine we have just a, <laughs> a review of what's going on. Uh, we have a rel rather uh, decentralized <clears throat> uh, healthcare system because we had more than three hundred, almost four hundred, I would say, um, ART sites before the war, and in during the course of the war only around 10% of them were shut down and uh, many of them continued their work even in the areas with uh, active hostilities and uh, some of them continued to work in the occupied areas, which is another issue that we are facing because in the occupied areas, uh, it's incredibly hard to maintain connection with the clinics, with the doctors and for them to maintain connection with the patients. And it is incredibly hard in terms of logistics because um, even refilling the stocks of the clinics in those occupied areas is, in, is, a, is a huge challenge. And sometimes even um, the humanitarian aid is refused by the local so-called governments and um, that's one of the biggest problems that we're facing now in those occupied areas uh, currently they are refusing to accept even humanitarian help uh, to refuse ARVs uh, for the patients and um, they are just forcing the patients basically to interrupt their treatment because also it's not safe to mention that they are HIV positive and uh 
there is uh, external stigma, there is self-stigmatization. So uh, I would say that the occupied areas currently are the biggest problem and the, high, and the biggest challenge that we are facing because uh, all those clinics that were damaged uh, by the active hostilities, they are now either rebuilt or moved to other places. So we are uh, pretty good in terms of the, those deoccupied areas, but um, those that are currently under occupation, that's that's a big, that's a huge challenge. And I would say this is uh, the main area that requires uh, the most attention now, because uh, we have a lot of people there, we have a lot of patients there, and that's something we need to talk about more than we do maybe. But, yeah, back to you, Yika. So, what are your what are the? Yeah, over to you. Yeah. Okay, I I wanted to add something which uh, Sabi just pointed out: uh, logistics. Um, in Nigeria, um, the alignment project or the alignment um, project that uh, NACA came up with, trying to uh, merge um, implementing partners and donor agents, uh, so that if uh, for example, Global Fund is working in Delta State. We should not have PEPFA working in Delta State. If uh, uh, PEPFA is working in Ondo State, we should not have Global Fund working there. So what they try to do is to put uh, funds together. Uh, one of the things that most of this crisis affects is um, distribution of commodities. What I mean commodities, I mean commodities like condoms, and uh, lubricants that we use uh, uh, in, uh, to distribute to uh, both at the facility and at the community levels to members of the communities, especially key population. Um, accessing these things become, uh, became very difficult even during the COVID and also in crisis prone areas. We have had a um, um, uh, fall in distribution rates due to uh, supply problems in supply chain. Um, for reporting, I hope I understood that question part very well. Um, one of the things that we've not reported very well are key populations. We, we, they're underreported. We, we're underreporting key populations in Nigeria. Of course, you know what the, the holders are, ensuring that that even uh, it's some, in, in a particular state where I worked recently, the uh, state coordinator told me that there is nothing like MSM in their state. That it doesn't exist. That it doesn't exist. Uh, later, when we started doing case finding and tracking cases and all that, and he started seeing things for himself, he was surprised. Um, the recent survey that was concluded uh, the Integrated uh, Biological Behavioral Surveillance Survey that we call IBBSS of 2020 puts the transgender community at about 20, 28% prevalent, HIV prevalence rate. Some people still tell us that there are no transgender in Nigeria, but they are, they exist in Nigeria. So there's need to shine lights in, in these areas. There is need to understand uh, this, the challenges of these communities bring them to the limelight and also need to channel more resources to those areas to ensure that at the end of the day, we are equalizing. Let me use the team for this year, uh, here now. We are equalizing because if in the next eight years, which is the set date for the end of AIDS uh, globally, we are still far behind. We are still behind. Let me not say far behind, we are still behind when it comes to key population. We've achieved quite a lot on um, mother-to-child transmission of HIV. We've done beautifully well, and we can still do better. But when it comes to key population, we have not done enough. We have not done enough. I, 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 um, um, most of the reporting uh, um, uh, females who inject drugs are underreported. We, we, we've not seen a, whole lot, a lot of light shine in that area. Another population that we have not gotten so much funding for and resources channeled to is people who are in prison. They are also key population. They are also key population by UNAIDS definition. They are also key population. We've not done enough in that regards. And um, 
what it's there like this and programs and platforms like this are a, a, a platform that provides us to shine the light towards those directions, that there is need for us to look at this area. There is need for us to do more reporting in this area. Uh, uh, journalists should bring their searchlight in these areas too. Um, donors in donor agencies should bring their, their, their funds in this direction. The next thing that Nigeria will be doing now is what they call alignment 2.0. 2.0 means that uh, implementing partners are handing over to government uh, because of the dwindling funds and uh, uh, so that government can handle these things in the next couple of years. Um, there's a whole lot of challenge that's going to come out, out of that because we know how things done. One of the successes, one of the reasons for the successes we achieved in Nigeria is that most of our intervention have been private led by CB, by, by, by implementing partners, by NGOs and all that, but the government providing support and, and, uh, and oversight. So I, I hope we can still sustain the gains that we have made using these platforms over the years and sustain them, especially things like the OSS I talked about. It, it, it costs a whole lot of money to run a one-stop shop where key populations are taking up services. How would the government fund them? Government that we're having issues funding primary health care centers will now start funding the OSS against a community that they criminalize and stigmatize and discriminate against. Uh, we, we just hope for the best. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, that was another really, really uh, impressively passionate uh, comment. Um, so, uh, Sagi, let's talk about um, now I'm the advocate for journalists. I'm speaking for journalists. I have also been able to report one or two issues on HIV, and um, most of the time, uh, it's still it looks as if uh, it's always it's still difficult, especially in some parts of the world, uh, for individuals that are living with HIV to come out openly, tell their stories publicly, and um, have their faces splashed on the covers of to actually humanize. Uh, those kinds of stories. We know if you, you know HIV advocates, uh, HIV uh, faces of HIV, uh, and individuals who are who have come to terms with the HIV status and are also willing to ensure that people learn from their stories. That without those kinds of voices, it may be extremely, really, really difficult uh, for journalists uh, to be able to write really good stories that put attention that humanizes these issues that you are talking about, actually the gaps. So my question is, um, probably it still ties to with the stigmatization, the stigma that is associated with the disease. And uh, so the question is this, over 40 years of dealing with HIV, why is stigma still a big deal? <laughs> why are we oh. still... And um, what is the situation in Ukraine? And um, how do you think, uh, what is the advice for journalists that really need to do this uh, in spite of the challenges uh, that they are expected to face? So I'll start with you, Sagi, and um, I will also come back to you, Yeka. Okay, so um, what's the situation in Ukraine? Um, yeah, of course, stigma exists. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I don't know a single country where there is uh, completely no stigma in terms of HIV. And it's a it's a global problem. And uh, I would divide it in two different parts. One of it, one of it is the external stigma, or the stigma of the society. And the second one is the self-stigmatization. Because uh, what I see in my patients, self-stigma in many cases is even a bigger problem because uh, people uh, stigmatize themselves and they are um, living in fear that if they come out with their diagnosis, they will be rejected by their family, they will lose their job, uh, they will lose their friends and uh, many other issues. But uh, in many cases, uh, in most of the cases, when people come out, um, I'm talking about my patients, patients from my clinic and experience of many of my colleagues, nothing changes in their life basically because their families accept them, their friends accept them, they are not losing their jobs. So I would say in Ukraine, self-stigma is 
well, is a huge issue. And uh, uh, I always tell my patients and uh, any other issues. But uh, in many cases, oh, sorry, I just heard myself <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> um, oh, wow, my voice is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> your voice is great you're sounding nice <laughs> it's fine it's fine <laughs> sorry for that um it's always unusual to hear yourself in your recording so <laughs> um yeah so uh i was talking about yeah self stigma and uh, uh i was what i always tell my patients that in 2022 now uh hiv is um is not the disease it was like 20 30 years ago it's a, an absolutely controlled condition basically all you need is uh you need to receive your treatment on a daily basis and you put well not let's not talk about injectables current but well you just receive your stable treatment you control your viral load and that's it because the life expectancy is pretty much the same as in the not infected pop in general population. Uh, the health profile is pretty much the same to the general population. So, and uh, of course, U equals U. So, I mean, these people are have no threat in terms of uh, potential um, infecting other people. So basically it's an absolutely controlled condition now. And of course we're all looking forward to the cure, but uh, even, I mean, no one is, stigmatized because they have diabetes mm -hmm. but it's pretty much the same because for diabetes you also need to receive a treatment on a daily basis mm -hmm. and uh it's a very serious condition when untreated it can cause death but it brings no stigma to those with diabetes i mean it's just just a condition that can be controlled and must be controlled and um that's what i tell my patients mainly that's that's pretty much the same you just need to find your treatment which is um good for you in terms of adverse events in terms of tolerability and that's it and you live a happy life you can have children you can have you can get married uh, and it's what, what the biggest problem is that society uh doesn't know that uh, and uh, I see the huge role of journalists is promoting this approach that it's it's not a life sentence that is, as it was some years ago, because I've seen the headlines like 20 years ago that it's a life that's a death sentence and that's it. If you have HIV equals it. No, it's it's absolutely different. It's not like that anymore. And uh, it's um, the, what that's what our society should be taught. That's what people need to understand because uh, that goes uh, what, what uh, Anikachi said in terms of um, MSM population. The younger population now, they have just, they just Google it and they pretty much know that it's, it's safe to talk to people with HIV, to have um, different relations with people with HIV, it's okay. But the older population, they are harder to reach and they, the level of self-stigmatization is way higher in the older population. And that's also, I believe, something that could be changed by journalists just bringing this attention that it's nothing more than a controlled condition. And that's it. Yes, it's it's dangerous. In term, It's important. I would say it's not dangerous. It's important to treat it. It should be treated. But that's it. I mean, just take your medicine and then live a happy life. I think it's not that simple. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> See, for for us in Nigeria, um, we come from a very conservative society. Uh, society is very conservative. Somebody said something. He said, um, "Sex is a cult, a cult that everybody belongs to. Yet nobody wants to be called a cultist." Um, the stigma attached to HIV, it's also because it's a sexually transmitted infection. It's a se sexually transmitted infection. And once you are positive, you are termed a promiscuous person. That's the, that's the point. Um, most people don't want to ignore or don't know that you can also contract HIV through other routes. 
um, um, stigma, I also want to agree with Sergei that self-stigma is also part of it. But in Nigeria, society stigma is higher, it's still higher. We have done some things actually over the years. We've tried behavior change, uh, communication messaging, um, um, uh, the agency uh, that, that takes care of AIDS in Nigeria. I've done quite a lot in messaging, but we've not done enough. We've not done enough. Some of the things we've done include changing uh, the meaning of how HIV is interpreted in our local languages. For example, in my Igbo language, before now, they call HIV Ubirinajocha. What it means is that you have got an infection that will end in death. That's, that's, that's tragic. You have got an infection that will end in death. That's just what it, it, it literally interprets. Uh, we, we, they've, they, they've started changing those languages, even for the other uh, um, um, local dialects. They've started changing those words so that people um, can see um, HIV AIDS from the angles against coming. It's just, it's just an infection. It's just a disease that can be better managed with the drugs that are available now. We have better treatment options than we've ever had in the history of HIV and AIDS. We have better informed healthcare professionals, better trained healthcare professionals now than we've ever had in the last 20 years. Uh, uh, before now, even healthcare workers, we are running away from, from uh, HIV uh, 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 patients and all that. But, Things are changing. People are seeing from that light. So there's still so much that we need to do in messaging. We're using the um, uh, religious organizations because our conservative uh, conservatism stems from both religion and culture and tradition. So we need to use our traditional our religious leaders to pass the message to pass the message that this is what this is. If you have HIV, it's not a death sentence. It's not judgment from God. It's not a condemnation and all that. When people start seeing this from different angles and also having watched what we call HIV champions, HIV champions, people who can boldly come out and say, I am HIV positive. I have been on drugs for six months, one year, two years, and look at me, I'm living a normal life. I have had, I am married, I have a child. These people should come out and become champions. Imagine if we have, um, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't want to call names. <laughs> I don't want to call names. If we have some big stars, big celebrities in Nigeria who are HIV positive, boldly come out and say, I'm HIV positive. And I'm, 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 I'm still able to achieve everything. I'm still able to pursue my, my career and achieve everything I wanted in life. And I have made it. These drugs help me until we start putting a face to this. Ah, we still have quite a long way to go. Stigma is still an issue. It's still an issue. Discrimination is still an issue. It's still an issue. Unlike where Sage is coming from, where um, you might not be stigmatized um, if you have uh, HIV in your workplace and all that. It might not be the same in some places today. Uh, come boldly and say you have HIV. You definitely have to have your colleagues to to contend with. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, we only have a few minutes to go. So uh, let me start with this. Uh, so what are your, what are your uh, expectations? Uh, what, uh, what are you optimistic about regarding the hate response? And um, what is your advice for journalists uh, that are covering this subject? Uh, let me start with Sage. Oh, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. My expectations. Well, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to new research in terms of HIV treatment because uh, I fully agree with Anikachi. We are currently at the best place in terms of um, HIV care than we have ever been, and it gets better and better every year. So, um, of course, I'm looking forward to. Um, HIV cure to uh, long acting drugs and their implementation all over the world because unfortunately they're not yet available in Ukraine. 
And uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that as long as we do our job good, I mean, all those involved in HIV care on all the levels, we will be able to do everything. We can change our policies in the countries. We can change the society attitude to uh, this disease. And uh, we, we, we can do that. And uh, I truly believe that the role of journalists currently is bringing society to a point where HIV will be recognized as a simple medical condition. Just um, this, I would say, well, for me and for uh, the colleagues from uh, from my from, from the journalists that I know, from the NGO sector that I uh, work with, uh, I that's my main message usually for them. Just uh, bring the society to a point where everybody will understand this, and then we'll have uh, the stigma will disappear by itself. So we, we should not. We, we, I would say that uh, our main goal is not finding stigma as it is, but bringing the society to a level where there will there will be no stigma, and uh, this is the easiest way as I see it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you. Okay. Um, uh... I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that with all what we've done in the last few years, um, we are heading somewhere. Um, like I said, Nigerian HIV response has been robust with all the lessons we've learned uh, over the years and with the fundings that have come in now. Um, I'm optimistic that government uh, would take over um, 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 the HIV both, uh, prevention and treatment angle and treatment itself, which they have been doing, um, they can improve upon that. I see them doing better because of the kind of leadership they have currently. Uh, if we continue with that trend, but it should be slow and steady. There is no need of rushing it. There's no need of rushing it and they will do well because the donor funds are gradually reducing by the year and they will not be there forever. So it's time we look at sustainability plans, solid uh, sustainability plans that will ensure that uh, those who are on treatment remain on treatment and that will continue with testing. Yeah, testing, testing is more targeted now, targeted testing. We are no longer testing everybody like we are doing. Uh, we are ensuring that we use uh, approaches that narrows down uh, those who actually need to be tested. Uh, and by that means, we are getting more positive. Um, for journalists, I think there is need, I want to uh, uh, buy into what Sergei said. Journalists should keep letting the public know, letting people know that this is where we are. Uh, I, I, posted on my, I posted on my Facebook this morning that uh, an HIV positive mother can have a, a, an HIV negative baby, that it's possible. Some people are surprised, wow, is it possible? These are areas that we need to shine light, that it's happening, that being HIV positive does not stop you from doing, living a normal, a normal life. It doesn't stop you. These are areas we need to shine the light. Um, we have a, a, a thriving movie industry. We need to shine the light, make movies that that humanize HIV for all people to see that uh, uh, it's humans that go through this and show positive angles about things that we have done, things that we've achieved, and maybe also the challenges and how we can sort them out. I really want to say that in the next few years, I hope and believe that an end to AIDS is possible. It's very possible. We may not achieve it by 2030, but I don't see it exceeding the next 15 years, 10 to 15 years. That's me. Thank you very much. Oh. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the International Center for Journalists, I want to thank the two of you uh, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your insightful contributions, uh, your knowledge, and of course, uh, your expertise in this field. And um, for journalists attending, uh, watching live uh, 
on the various uh, channels. I said, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we couldn't take your questions. I mean, didn't know we've already existed all the time. And uh, so if you have any question that you would like me to, any of these uh, awesome guests uh, to address, do not hesitate to reach out. And um, we are going to pass these questions on to them. And they're more than willing to answer these questions. And um, for, uh, for more information, and uh, one of the ways that you can, uh, for those that have already have been sending messages regarding requesting for videos of this uh, of this session, just be aware that the videos of this session uh, would be available uh, very very soon within uh, very within so usually within eight hours uh, would be available on ICFJ's uh, YouTube page. Uh, do not hesitate to check it out. And uh, but for you to be able to quickly assess it, uh, you can join our Facebook group. Uh, where we share tools, resources, and insights that may be of benefit to you. Uh, so just click the link uh, that I just put in the chat box, and um, we are going to ensure that that's what we are going to share the link of videos when they become available and other uh, resources that we may consider to be useful for you. We have a very thriving ecosystem of journalists in different parts of the world, and we network and uh, we share resources in person and online, and we hope we'll continue to do that. To learn more about the International Center for Journalists, please get, check out www.icfj.org. Uh, we are also encouraging you to access resources on MyJNet, on www.igenet.org. And these resources are in different languages, up to eight languages, and they cover a whole lot of uh, topical issues that we may, you may consider relevant uh, for you. So on behalf of the entire team behind this production, I say thank you very much uh, for being with us today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and we join you and I will see you next week. Bye from me.